here in the hot shop where you're looking at some glass blowing equipment and I'm going to make a, a, a bowl shape today that will have a ruffled edge and the color of that bowl is going to be a, an amethyst red, sort of a light violet color, not a real dark purple or anything, but it's a little softer and it will also have a, a base that's full of multi chips of colored glass and those same colors on that base are going to be on the rim around the opening of the form as well. But before we get into all that, first off, let me just introduce you to the glass furnace. Glass. Our furnace runs 24 hours a day, nonstop, a little over 2,050 degrees, and it holds anywhere from 500 to 1,000 pounds of molten clear glass. And of course, that's uh, natural gas and forced air going through a series of pipes and flame safeties and temperature controls that prevent us from melting down the building, which is a good thing. But again, we keep that furnace on 24 seven, so the glass is always ready to go. If that furnace was to shut off and go cold overnight, let's say it would cool down to 1,000 degrees, it would take almost two days again to get the entire thermal mass of that furnace back up to temperature. So it takes a long time and a lot of energy to get it up there. So once it's there, it's, you know, the insulation of the bricks keeps that heat in and works out pretty well for us. And then I have some of the pipes and metal rods I'll be using warming up in the fire just next to the furnace there. The metal has to be preheated in order for the glass to fuse or to stick onto the end of the pipes and the metal rods. And then I have another reheating chamber to the right that is uh, hot right now for us that I'll be using to reheat the glass in. That oven is called the glory hole. And um, I'm going to get my assistant to start it here I think in just a moment. Mary Lane is coming to help me today. Once again, it's, it's always nice to have extra arms when you're doing the glass blowing process. You know, it makes the work go a little bit easier and you don't have to have all the heat on yourself. You can share it a little bit. Mary's going to get a, a blowpipe going here in a moment and, and she's going to apply some color onto the end of the blowpipe to get that started. So while she's doing that, I'm going to talk about glass a little bit by itself. I'm going to show you two forms of glass that I have here. The one is the white pellets. This is a pelletized version of the raw ingredients of glass. This is what we call the batch, which is your mixture of silica, sand, soda, ash, and limestone. And again, normally that mixture might be in a, you know, like a very loose powdery flour type, you know, consistency. Some of the companies that mix the batch though will pelletize it so it's not so dusty. But uh, again, because we are in the glass pavilion and we are sharing our space with the museum's collection, we are now using a glass, these little nuggets of glass. This little glass here is what we call cullet. And we buy the cullet by the ton. And our studio techs, like Mary, come in in the evening. And they'll put, you know, 150, 200 pounds of that cullet glass right back into the furnace, right there in the opening where I take it out. And we might, you know, we usually turn the temperature up to about 2,300 degrees, which accelerates the melting process. And so 12 hours later, that 150 to 200 pounds of glass is reheated, remelted, and has joined the rest of the pool of molten glass and is ready to go. So again, we've eliminated a lot of the dust from the batch ingredients to working with just the pre-melted glass. And it's the same formula in this colored glass that we're using. Now, of course, every glass has a different formula. The, the walls in our building, the windshield on your car, your drinking glass at home, they have most of those same ingredients but they're going to be in different proportion to one another in terms of you know, what the manufacturer is trying to create with that kind of glass. Some glass will stay hot and fluid for a long time. Other glass will hold its shape very quickly when it's you know, formed you know, in the machines that are you know, creating that object. So but that's the clear glass industry. And again, there's lots of different ways of using that glass. In fact, I'm going to take a little bit of glass out of the furnace right now on the end of a metal rod. This metal rod is what we call a punty. And I'm just going to dip the end of that into the pool here of the molten glass. And again, if you were to look inside that furnace, it's a rectangular shape. And of course, the furnace is made up of different types of bricks. And the glass is just in there, like in a pool form. But right here, though, this clear glass, this is about 2,000 degrees when it comes out of the furnace fresh like it is. And of course, while it's hot, we can stretch that material out pretty quickly, form it into different things. 
I like these little teardrops I've been doing lately. But we have enough glass here that we can stretch the thread easily as thin as your hair. Oh my gosh, that could be pulled out as long as a football field if we had enough room. And that's a pretty thick strand of glass right there that I just broke. But nonetheless though, this thread, that's pretty thick. It could be stretched out very, very far. Now also because I stretched it out so far, it's lost all its heat and I'm able to, you know, actually touch this glass. And of course you can bend glass when it's thin. Most of the time though we don't have any glass that is like that, so we are unable to do that at home. But we use glass threads all the time. It's called insulation. We use it in our, you know, at home in our walls, keeping us warm this time of the year. And another uh, more modern use for glass threads is what we call optic fiber, which we use in communications. And they, they pulse light through it and have ways of decoding that information. And next thing you know, we're, we're talking and sending images back and forth across the country. So, but Mary's got that color on the end of the pipe warmed up for me. And I'm gonna let her hold it just one more moment while I show you some color because we didn't get quite to that point yet. But in this container, I have some crushed colored chips of glass. Again, this is what we call frit. We buy our colors already pre-melted and pre-formed. Most of the color we use comes from Germany and Italy, and we get a lot now for all the way from New Zealand. And I have some of that up here on the table, and I'll be using that in just a moment. But the base color, again, as I mentioned before, is that amethyst blue color, and Mary picked up a larger piece of that color out of the oven right here that was pre-warming, because you can't take cold glass and just throw it into the fire. You have to preheat it a little bit, otherwise we have a, a situation known as thermal shock, where that temperature change would actually make the glass crack. So we pre-warm it a little bit, and she gets the pipe hot, and then she finished heating it up there in the glory hole oven, and it's ready to go. Yes? Yes. All right, so my turn. We're going to get some glass here out of the furnace. Now, every time we go into the furnace and apply glass onto one of the pipes or one of the metal rods, we call this a gather of glass. This is gather number one. And I'm going to sit here at my workbench and do a little shaping on this using a wooden cup we call a block. And the blocks are made out of cherry wood. And we keep the blocks in water so they don't burn up too fast, but we also need that moisture to, to create a pocket of steam which protects the glass from getting scarred. It also allows it to sort of glide nice and smoothly against that wood. Now again, if you can't see this directly from your seat, you might want to watch the monitor above. I think we're on camera there pretty well. Okay. But the wood blocks though, again, that's a tool that's been used for over 2,000 years for glass forming. Glass has a very long history but glass blowing has only been around 2,000 years. And of course, the last 100 years or so, we've been actually able to do it with machines, automatic glass blowing machines. And that whole part of the industry started right here in Toledo, Ohio. So, now let's add a little bit of air here to the bubble. Not too much, I just wanna inflate that a little bit. And again, that dark orange in the center, that is the violet colored glass. And as the bubble expands, that chunk of color will cover the interior of the bubble like a veneer, a real thin coating. So visually, as it blows out farther and farther, eventually the whole bubble will look like that purplish color glass. And again, we're just looking at layers of clear and layers of color. Many of the examples in our collection, you'd be able to see that, you know, depending upon the thickness of the object. But there are some pieces, obviously, you could have a furnace full of colored glass, but it's a lot easier for us to just buy color and mix it in the working process with the clear. We have over 100 colors available to us, you know, transparent and opaque. And of course, colors come from when we add metal oxides to the batch mixture. So, if you were to add cobalt to this mixture and melt it, that'll make blue. You add iron, that'll make a green. To make a purple, you would add manganese. Uh, the amethyst here that I'm using though, that actually has a little bit of gold in it and probably some manganese to get the color right. But again, all different types of metal will create different colors. Pink and red, those colors, that comes from adding gold most of the time, so. Now this has lost a lot of the heat. This is about 1,000 degrees still, but it is very solid on the pipe. 
I can go in for another layer of glass. This will now support the next layer here that I'm getting. And of course, every time I go in that furnace and add that next gather, the, the amount increases quite a bit. But this will allow me now to create the shape that I want. If otherwise, I'd, I wouldn't have enough glass. We'll still be doing one more gather on top of this. But in the meantime, a little more shaping here. using that cup to get the, the glass nice and uniform here on the end of the pipe. And I'm going to introduce just a little more heat on this to even the temperature out in the glass. And I'll continue to blow the bubble out a little more as well. Not a lot, but I still want to, I still want to make that just a little bit larger. And then we'll let it cool down again before we go in for our third layer of glass. If the bubble is too hot and we continue to add more on top of it, we run the risk of the bubble collapsing because of its own weight and its own heat. So, this is warmed up pretty good now. You can see that it's moving freely. I'm just going to introduce a little more air. Just a little bit. Now, if the glass is hot, it's pretty easy to make the bubble expand. I don't have to work too hard if it's hot. If the glass is cold, you know, then I can stand here all day and huff and puff, and I'm not going to make it go anywhere. And of course, now we're in the waiting game. We're going to wait for that to cool off. Now, the pipes are hot. I wouldn't want you to think that they're not. The blow pipes do get hot. And when they are a little warm, I have a little water fountain here that we like to use to cool them down. First thing we teach our students here in the pavilion is about safety and of course, you know, this is one of those tools that you use to keep, to keep yourself safe. Interestingly enough, an accident will occur from the hot tools before it usually happens from the hot glass because we already know that the glass is hot and we have an instinct to stay away from it. But the tools, though, they don't look hot, and we can be fooled by that. So, again, you know, teaching the students how to handle the tools, keep themselves safe, that's, you know, certainly our priority. Now, again, this is cooling down. I'm almost ready for the next layer. It's still over 1,000 degrees, though, on the end of the pipe. Can't let the glass get too cold, because it could just break right off the pipe because of that thermal shock and change. But if you see the glass moving at all, it's about 1,400 to 1,500 degrees. I think we're ready, though, for that next layer. So, all right. Gather number three. And I'll give you a, a quick example here of what happens when we don't turn the pipe. When I come out of the furnace, I'm going to do a little trail of the extra glass into a bucket of water I have up here by the furnace. Again, this has the consistency of honey. Very hot when it's, you know, moving like that. little bucket of water to catch that extra glass there. And one last little flash of heat. Kind of reheat that on the bottom where it trailed away. But that is a trail off gather. Again, that helps me control the amount that I put on the end of the pipe. And it gives you a nice visual as to seeing, again, how fluid the material is when it's fresh. All right. And the next block and more shaping. Excuse me. And again, that dark orange in the center is our violet, our violet blue reddish color. Everything else around it is clear glass. It looks orange though, again, because of how hot it is. As the piece blows out farther and works a little cooler, you will be able to see the true color of the object come up to the surface. And in a moment, I'm going to have Mary warm this up for me, I think and we'll continue to inflate the bubble. Now, she's going to get it warm for me over there in the oven, and I'm going to do the shaping at the other end when she comes back. 
This is the team thing that works together nicely. I'm using a new tool here, relatively new in the history of glass making, but this is a pad of wet newspaper. And this will allow me to get almost in direct contact with the glass. And as soon as Mary's ready with the glass, I should say if the glass is ready, here we go. So on with the air, I'm doing the shaping. The bubble will expand nice and evenly. That's a good heat. A little more, please. And let's stop right there. Again, that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Just that little pad of wet paper between me and that 16, 1700 degree glass. Now I'm going to reheat again here in the oven. Mary's going to warm up another tool that I'm going to use here in just a moment and apply a little beeswax to it. Yes, please. The tool she's going to show you also is the tool we call the jacks. Again, this is a traditional glass blower's tool. Oh yeah, come from the other side. The jacks that look like large tweezers will allow me to pinch and shape the glass and help me form the glass. Again, it's our primary hand tool for working with the material. And again, that's a tool that is unchanged in its design now for 2,000 years. The only thing that's really different about them now is the fact that they're made out of stainless steel. So here are the jacks and the jacks on glass. Again, this crease that I'm putting on the bubble, this is a, a mark we call the neckline or the jack line. And this will be the location where the bubble will become separated from the pipe during our process. In the meantime, though, I think a little more air. And we'll inflate this a little bit more. On, please. There we go. And off. Now, already at this point, you can no longer really see the separation between the clear glass and where the color begins because that color has pushed itself towards the surface from the inside. And it all looks like almost one color now. I'm going to do one more reheat and a little more air here. Blow it out just a little farther. Now the bubble is going to start to show its true color here in just a few moments. Again, we're starting to work it a little bit on the cooler side. Once I get the shape just the way I like it, I'm going to apply the, the glass base that has the color frit on it. We'll be working together in our team again like that. Just a little more, a little more expansion here on the bubble. I move my sleeves around a little bit too. It's starting to put off a little more heat. Again, I'm wearing some Kevlar sleeves to protect my arms from that radiant heat. Okay, didn't need too much. And again, I'm holding it in a downward angle to help it elongate. And softly, on. All right, and off. That's good. So we're going to let this cool off a little bit more because I don't really want it moving when I do the next step. But I am going to let Mary keep it turning for me. Again, if the glass is hot and fluid, the pipe has to stay in motion so that it won't get off center. Otherwise, gravity would have that bend and stretch irregularly very quickly. So I'm waiting for that to really get to about the right temperature. She says good. All right. I'm going to take another tool here we call a gathering iron and get a gob of glass, another gather of glass from the furnace. One short flash, Mary, please. There you go. She's coming out. And again, I'm dripping this hot glass right here on the pile of colored glass frit. And of course, that frit is melting immediately now on the surface of that hot glass underneath it. And hot glass likes to stick to hot glass, so this cookie of glass and chips will apply easily to the bottom. 
And of course, now I'm going to add more heat and we'll finish melting those little chips in. And then I'll go back to the workbench and do a little fine tuning on the shape of that base. I'm going to get that nice and round and flat on the bottom. I'll have Mary walk by so you can get a good look at the colors. Again, my favorite tool, the newspaper, bringing everything back in line. I have Mary give me a little air again to blow on this. Just going to form that bubble out a little bit again. On, please. And we'll stop right there. Again, the paddle is just to flatten that base off. Just square that up. A little flash of heat. And I'll look at it one more time. Now, of course, the bubble is really cooled off quite a bit. You can really see the true color of that violet in there. The, the foot, though, is still pretty warm, so that's why it's still sort of a brighter orange. We're going to try to balance the temperatures here a little bit before we go on to the next step, which is to remove the bubble from the pipe and attach it to another metal rod, again, another punny rod. And we're going to change the axis to what we're working on. And by doing that, I'll then have the opening of the vessel facing away. And I'll be able to use the heat and the jacks to shape the opening of the form. So, here you go, Mary. Little flash, and then you can walk by and show them. And I'm going to get myself set up then for that transfer. And you get to have a good look at it with all its color on the bottom. Of course, that clear glass cookie, that little cake of glass, it really will magnify the color on the bottom of the piece. So as you're looking at it from the side view, it's like it's got its own little island of, of colored glass frit. So. We love being able to have our audiences so close and direct with us in our presentations because it really gives you a feel of what we're trying to do here. It's not like you're off in a loft hiding away. We want you to feel the heat and smell the wood burning. It's part of that experience. So again, Mary's giving that one little flash of heat. And she'll come back and sit down and I'll get ready to do my next part. Again, using another metal rod, another punny. I'm going to get a small gob of glass. And this glass will act like the glue, which will allow the vessel to stay connected to the pipe when I break it off of this pipe. So first off, though, we'll make a little attachment right here on that bottom. Get in the bullseye there in the center. And again, I'm waiting for the temperature of the glass to be correct so I can control that easily when it breaks off the pipe. And everything is in alignment on the same axis, the pipe, the punny rod I'm turning, everything in a line. Once it's there, I'm going to introduce a little bit of water up here to the neck where I made that with the jacks earlier. And that water chills the glass and starts a small fracture. And all I have to do is give the pipe a vibration and it should all come right apart. So I now have the opening facing away. And I'm going to continue to heat the opening of the vessel. And we'll shape it some more with the jacks. Meanwhile, though, Mary is going to get another gob of glass on a punny and roll it again into that colored frit on the table. And we're going to do an application of that color around the opening of this vessel. This is a technique that we refer to as a lip wrap. But it will give the rim of the bowl a nice little splash of color. Meanwhile, though, I'm reheating the opening and I'll get ready to shape it again with the jacks when I come back to the workbench. And I'd like to thank everybody again for coming to our presentation today. Our demonstrations are sponsored by the Libby Glass Company. They help to pay for our materials and they replace our wood paddles and, you know, they give us a little extra help when we have to get new pipes. 
Of course, Libby Glass is one of our oldest industries here in Toledo and one of the oldest glass companies in America. Yeah, in just a few more moments here, I'll get this back to the workbench and we'll adjust that a little bit again. Meanwhile, of course, I know Mary's getting that color lip ready. And I've got a little bit of time before she's ready as well. A little flattening and a little shaping, a little adjustments. Again, we just don't make the piece instantly. It sort of has to be coaxed and massaged along the way. How you doing, Mary? This time? Shortly, should I go back? All right, I'm gonna get myself settled in over here at the bench. Actually, I'm not. <laughs> I need these first. So Mary's on standby, she's still waiting for me. I needed those shears. One more little flash of heat to keep this thing at the right temperature. Again, working with teammates, you have to keep in communication with one another to let all this work together. Set. So she'll come over with that hot gob of glass and then on we go. A little attachment right there on the rim, a little stretch, nice little roll. Another little trim of the excess. And I now have a nice, nice little rim of color around the opening of the form. And of course, back to the heat. Can only shape the glass if the glass is hot again, so it's back to the heat. Now once that opening is nice and hot, I'll come back to the bench, use the jacks to increase the diameter. Mary will use a wood paddle to keep the opening nice and flat and we'll keep everything on center. This is gonna be done in about two or three reheats, so we're almost finished. Again, the final shape is gonna have a, a ruffled opening. The Italians called the shape a handkerchief vase. That's what they titled it several centuries ago because it reminds maidens of a dropping handkerchief. Some of our students call them floppy bowls, but I kinda like the handkerchief vase name myself better. All right, so there, nice and hot on the opening. Back to the jacks. Mary's coming in, on please. I'm gonna take one more reheat off. Again, that first touch with, with the glass, we've changed the shape of that quite a bit already. So two more reheats and we'll have this completed. Got some glass cracking up here. Again, the glass, if it cools down too quickly, it will fracture. And that's what it's doing, that's what you hear right now, that cracking sound from the pipes up in front. It's the glass cracking off those pipes that we were just using. For this piece of glass to prevent that from happening, I'll be putting the object away into an oven that we call the annealing oven. And it will take about 24 to 30 hours for the object to cool down. So, Mary coming on back. Couple more little touches here. Yeah, got a little fire here. That's for your entertainment. That's a drama there. Okay, nobody's actually on fire. All right, one more reheat again. Here's another nice little shape. This will be the final reheat in the glory hole. Move that shield back so everybody can see this. I'm going to allow the opening of the vessel to become very hot. And as that glass becomes more fluid, I'll begin to spin the punny rod faster. And the centrifugal force will cause that glass to flare open. And for a short period of time, it'll be a little bit like a plate. And in the last moments, then I'll use gravity to make that dropping handkerchief vase shape. So again, we'll be done here in about 10, 12 seconds. Ooh, it's hot up here.
Again, a good spin. Make that glass open up nicely for me. Keep that turning for a few more moments. And then again, by angling it down, the gravity pulls the glass. Gives me a nice little shape. Again, each one is different. That's what makes it fun for us. Yeah, how about that? And I'm going to hold it like this until it cools off. It comes back to a solid. And then we'll get ready to remove it from the pipe and place it in the oven over there to your far right. The big silver boxes you see on both sides of the room, those are the annealing ovens. They're about 950 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, this will take about 24 to 30 hours to cool down. And that's about ready to come off. So I'm going to step away over here. We'll get ready to do that. I have a little table here of high temperature insulation that will hold the piece for me on while we do our final little adjustments. And again, just a small drop of water right here at the base where it's connected. Sets up just a little stress. And again, another vibration breaks that right off. Of course, where it broke off is very sharp, so we use a torch to heat that glass up. This we call fire polishing. This will remove all the sharp edges. And once that glass is soft enough, I'm going to stamp at the bottom with a, a museum logo that will identify this then as a museum demonstration piece. And again, just another little blast of heat. And of course, it's still a thousand degrees, so that's why Mary's holding the gloves. She'll pick that up, and from here into the box it goes. She'll slide that right in there, and she'll get out of there quickly again because it's 950 degrees. Nobody likes to be in there for very long. So, 24 to 30 hours later, it'll come out, and if it looks good, it might end up over here in the coffee shop for sale, and we'll go from there. But otherwise, everybody, I hope you enjoyed that presentation today. That was a lot of fun for me. Oh, thank you. And if, again, anybody has any questions, i am certainly be glad to answer those for you. Otherwise, I'd love to have you as a student. So come on back for that sometime.